welcome to this week's edition of the magnets and you know that uh, the magnet is a program we call it mentoring on television some others call it bringing out the business in you there's nobody who doesn't have some innate potentials it's for you to process them and bring them out so that you can be relevant add value to whatever profession or task you decide to do today is promised kept we have decided to dedicate some episodes to raise the consciousness and awareness on the pandemic that is presently going so all the past episodes and even this present one we're going to be talking about medical practice what has been the Im impact we're going to be talking about family health today and you know that uh, the coronavirus is a uh, majorly affecting the entire family even if one person in the family is affected has a great impact so what's the relevance of family health to the pandemic we have an expert an internationally acclaimed medical practitioner join us on the other side when we bring you this short profile of our magnet for the week we'll be back shortly Born on the 20th of September 1956 at Ierio South EB, Isako, West Local Government, area of Edo State. His elementary school was at Ierio Primary School, where he passed out in 1970 with his first living school certificate before proceeding to Our Lady of Fatima College with scholarship by the then Bendel State. He concluded his secondary education in 1975 and was among the privileged few to have his medical training at the University College Hospital of the Premier University. Ibadan, which he commenced in 1976 with the scholarship secured by the federal government due to his brilliance. His educational prowess also saw Dr. Dako as Hill Royal Infirmary from 1990 to 1991, National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria from 2011 to 2013, Healthcare Leadership Academy from 2015 to 2016. His postgraduate training was courtesy double sponsorship by his Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist London. He has since decided to carve a niche for private sector as the medical director of Daco Medical Center, as he is also double as the founder of Daco Foundation for Rural Health Care and Education, a member of several professional associations with numerous honors to his credits. Dr. Mahmoud Daco is the president of Esako Club 81, immediate past president of Our Lady of Fatima. How would you rate the state of medical practice in the country, Edo State particularly, Edo North? Join our medical experts and our main anchor in the studio for this week's edition of The Magnets. This is The Magnet. You're welcome back to the program. Having gotten a bit of information about our magnet for the week, my pleasure. Live in the studio, Dr. Mahmoud Dako. He is the medical director of Dako Medical Center. You're welcome to The Magnet, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so you're an expert in family health. For those of us who don't know, let's have an overview because we say this is a mentoring on TV. In fact, it's like teaching. What exactly is family health to the understanding of the layman there? Well, the, the family is the basic uh, unit of the society. So the head that involves such a unit is called family head. That is father, mother, and children. Okay. So family medicine has to do with the uh, health care of the whole family. Okay. I am curious about um, your progression in life. In fact, the, the brief, the profile that we did, you spent majority of part, the younger part of your life back in Edo State, that is from South EBA to be precise. Your primary school, secondary school, you know, were there. Was that deliberate or just because you were born there? Oh, I think it was just natural. The, I was born in rural community. My parents never had opportunity of going outside the communities. So I grew up there. It was only natural. I had to attend all my initial schools in the community. Okay, eventually you got, um, virtually all your education was scholarship. Were you that brilliant? Let's share with us. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> I don't know if I was brilliant because uh, it's left for others to see whether you were brilliant. It's true that how scholarship doesn't come just like that. It's out of brilliance that you get it. 
Where? Yeah, where all my scholarships came through. I mean, we're all academic scholarships, actually. Exactly. Maybe I was brilliant. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you are being modest. <laughs> okay, why well, I actually asked about, you know, the rule and some of your practice, you tend to tilt towards or have sympathy or empathy for the rural folks in your medical practice, even in your foundation. You're also the founder of uh, Daco uh, Foundation. You know, what do you have to say about this? Well, yes, yeah, that's very true. We call it empathy. See, we, we grew up in a, a community where social amenities were essentially not in existence. And uh, that was far back, 40, 50 years ago, 60. And uh, it will interest you to know that up to now, things are still like that. In fact, in some cases, worse than the were when we were there. Okay. And uh, for someone like me who has had the opportunity of seeing the other way, I always believe there should be a need to go back to the source societies and give back to them. Well, considering your brilliance, one would expect that uh, you should actually be a teacher in uh, teaching hospitals, but you chose to remain in the private sector. Is there a reason for that? Well, that is a very interesting question. The, during our time, the options were very few, and we actually had nobody to guide us. Like in the case of my own children, for example, who are actually in medicine as well, and some of them are lecturing in the university because they have somebody to advise them, they have role models. I didn't have any. So many of us, we, we're ju just by chance, we find ourselves where we are today, many, including myself. But by now, I should be addressing you as a prof. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. so what has it been? Because some people, I don't know if it's erroneous or not, this is the magnet anyway. There's no profession. We look at the profession in a way you earn a living, you spend money. So it's your being in the private sector. Is it a money spending decision or you have, made, you have been smiling to the bank? Well, I think uh, the most important thing in your profession is making impact. The amount of people you have impacted their lives, those people whose life you have changed positively. And uh, for most people that I know of in private practice, I don't think that money making is actually their main reason. Because you want to make money, medicine is not the place. If you do buy and sell it with the utility you have as a doctor, you make more money. Go into a con contract, you make more money. Go into a politics, you make more money. But remaining in a medical practice gives you the opportunity to touch many lives. And we have touched a lot of lives? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly with your foundation. Okay. Well, we are still chatting with Dr. Mahmoud Dako, mm -hmm. the medical director of Dako Medical Center. Let's go for this short break. We'll be back shortly. You're welcome back. This is The Magnets. Today we are discussing family health and we have an expert in the house. A magnet for the week is Dr. Mahmoud Dako, the medical director of Dako Medical Center. He's also a founder of Dako Foundation. He has a lot more feathers on his cap, though he's not wearing one now. <laughs> okay, we are in the era of pandemic, coronavirus. We know that there are a lot of isolation centers around. Have you been confronted with diagnosing any or suspecting one and then what has your medical practice in the private sector what has it been like with what we are experiencing today as a family health physician yes we see we've seen quite a lot of uh, suspected cases uh although not until the test is done and confirmed you will not say you've seen the confirmed cases i mean some, some confirmed, uh, confirmed cases we've seen a lot of people with all the complete symptoms you can think about difficulty in breathing, weakness, uh, dry cough, and the rest. But unfortunately, because of the system we operate, getting them tested is a big problem. Hmm. Some of them, these days, they ask you to register online. You do. Hmm. You, you stay there until either you die of the disease or you get well. Nobody will ask you, uh, oh, come on, today is your testing day. Of all the people we have got, only two were tested. We had up to ten that were actually reported to the authorities. Only two were tested and they were positive. Hmm, and they were confirmed to? Positive. <laughs> okay, so I'm just wondering what uh, the kind of uh, danger you and your colleagues face when you, you have to 
bring in patient or patients do such come to you and uh, how prepared was Nigeria ever prepared for this kind of outbreak this pandemic that we are experiencing well Nigeria ever prepared that's a big question I don't know if we ever prepared for anything in this country <laughs> we did very well with Ebola and the infrastructure for Ebola management were still in place when this uh, pandemic came and uh, I think uh, we were able to use the uh, infrastructure and the DG of uh, NCDC2, the very proactive man, I think he's done very well. And uh, I don't know whether I would say God has been on our side or nature has been on our side. The kind of explosion we've seen in many countries, advanced countries, they mm -hmm. have the means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't have it, and I pray we don't have it. Otherwise, it will be a serious disaster. Because we don't have the PPE. We don't have enough. I mean, even in government hospitals, they are not available. Maybe funds, I don't know. I don't know why. The kind of news we hear in the media and all that is a bit scary. Do you think, what impact a family physician or family health physician, what impact do you think, long run, short run, will this pandemic have if it does not abate soon enough? Well, I believe that uh, the pandemic will actually be like uh, our malaria and our HIV wow. and the. Uh, uh, in fact, even in a matter form than the uh, HIV uh, situation, because with time you have this herd immunity, which will protect, I mean, give some protection to most communities. And uh, we have to live with it. I don't see it disappearing very soon. It's like you people, all of you doctors have had a conference, you are saying the same thing, it's here to stay, it's, we just have to live with it. And uh, is that not scary considering the, the, the dangerous nature of it? You know, the pandemic is a, a, is a global health, of, it's of global health concern. And in global health, infection anywhere is infection everywhere. If you remember when this started in Wuhan in China, mm -hmm. nobody ever thought of Nigeria. But nowadays, because of international travels, I mean, within 48 hours, you can start from uh, 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 Brazil and you are in Australia. And whatever disease you carry, you can disseminate anywhere. Okay. I think prevention, I mean, prevention as we are doing now will actually be the main thing that will help to limit the spread. Okay, this is, the thing is of concern is that some people are of the opinion that uh, the coronavirus is not even as dangerous as the hunger in the land anymore. A lot of uh, private sector, the government, they have been doing palliative. Uh, I said you are somebody with several feathers to the cap. You are also the sitting president of Isako Club Beauty One. Your club also do some palliative at uh, a donut. You know, how effective do you think this palliative has been? Well, palliative is just a, I mean, a drop of oil in the ocean. I mean, I don't know how many people have actually fed those people for two months, nonstop. You give them, they eat it today, that is the end. You won't come again tomorrow to give them. It's a big problem. And uh, at the end of the day, I don't know which one is actually more serious. Hunger or the disease itself. And uh, the, the hunger, which is fed by these people, is the one they believe in. Many of them don't believe there's anything like a, a yeah. coronavirus because they are seeing the impact of hunger straight away. Since they have not seen anybody with coronavirus, which, I mean, we are lucky again in this country, uh, when they go to uh, community spread, many of us were expecting an explosion in our rural communities. But for reasons that we cannot explain, the people in rural communities, they don't even wear masks. They don't I mean, believe in social distancing. We are not seeing many of them coming around with the disease. So they believe more in hunger than coronavirus. So where should we draw the line now? They say stay safe, social distancing, don't go out. Don't do. People have to eat, people have to work. How do we correlate all this? Well, I think uh, even the government are actually confused. They don't know what to do because uh, if they go this way, people will comment. Go the other way, people will comment. I think that gradually we reach uh, I mean, uh, uh, the middle of the whole thing and that we will be accepted by everybody because the economy has to go on. We cannot cl uh, close down for, for, the whole, for the whole year, schools close down, economy close down. It's not going to be possible. Maybe with time, through our social, I mean, social distancing, washing of hands, and uh, wearing face masks, we reduce the fashion rate and the economy will take off. Okay. Uh, I'm curious about your leadership qualities. 
I'm not so sure if you occupied any position while you were growing up, whether in primary or secondary, I think whether you were a senior professor, but you are the immediate past president of a um, Our Lady of Fatima College that was known as Otaru Grammar School those days. And now you are the sitting president of Isako Club 81. I want to ask this vis-a-vis -vis your foundation. You are more concerned about impacting those of the rural descent. Is there any reason for that? Well, uh, in my secondary school days, I was class prefect from class one to class four. Mm -hmm. And in class five, I became the senior prefect. I can assure you that whoever passes through that school today, we know that name because of the legacy one left behind in leadership. And uh, I see, go back to the school regularly to take care of uh, the needy. In that school, I have two cups I've donated for people to compete for. I've been involved in a lot of things there, building the laboratories, electrifying the place, and uh, giving talks to the young ones regularly. And uh, it, it, it's been part of me right from the beginning that leadership uh, trait. And uh, in the in the Sacral Club 81, something is very interesting that people don't usually think about. I'm not aware of any person who spent the, the number of years I spent in that club before becoming president. <laughs> <laughs> and you, they were fished out. And in my position, usually I don't lobby for positions. The same thing happened in uh, a lady of Fatima Old Boys. When I took over as the president worldwide, I told them, I'm going to act uh, locally and think globally. That is, what is the best practice anywhere in the world? I will bring it to this place. And by the time I'm leaving the office, people will contest for this position to the media. And exactly that is what happened. The place has become so attractive. Not because we, they make money. I mean, to, the time I stayed there, I inherited, uh, I think, about 200,000. When I was leaving, I left about 7 million. Wow. With all the projects we executed. And uh, a very important thing I think I succeeded in doing is uh, having somebody who can continue with the job you did. Succession plan. Because I had a succession plan from day one. There will be somebody who can perform and uh, who will not destroy the legacy you are going to leave behind. Okay. And it will interest me in my own usual way. This is the time I step down, I step down. I don't interfere. Okay, if from what it is you have said, judging from your resume, what is your concern for people for community development? Because earlier on we were talking about pra uh, medical practice, you are talking about the private partnership. Let's look at it vis-a-vis -vis from the medical facilities in Edo North, where you are from. How will you rate it compared to the facilities in Edo generally and even Nigeria? Because as a medical practitioner, one will expect that you've done so much for a medical facility to be optimal in Edo North. Well, that's a good question. I've never occupied a government position where you can make uh, policies. But I have been to virtually all the head facilities in the whole of Edenot. By virtue of your foundation? By virtue of my foundation. And uh, the funding, the, what we found in that place is not good for the year to year. At least when you look at a place like Lagos, where I reside, I mean, you go to General Hospital in Lagos, you see what goes on, you go to the health center, you see action, people are treated, people go home with drugs, people are operated free, uh, free of charge. In Edenot, it's a disaster. I have any forum I find myself, I don't pretend in telling people what I, see, what I have seen there. I have pictures. When you get to a general hospital around 2 p.m. in the evening, in the afternoon, you don't see a single patient. You don't even see a doctor. When you see somebody, they tell you, oh, there are no patients. I cannot be patient when there are no doctors to attend to them. You go to the, their ward, they are empty, no single patient there, and salaries are still being paid. You go to the rural, rural centers, it's worse. I mean, the... Like I, I keep telling all my friends, the emergencies we see in Lagos, they exist everywhere. I mean, somebody has a ruptured appendix, somebody has a ruptured uterus, somebody has a, an accident. Most of them die in rural areas because nobody attends to them. But in places like Lagos, where things are, Lagos being very well, Lagos is doing very well in healthcare delivery. I mean, I give it to them. I, I have told them in many minutes where I met many of them that look, the model you will have, our which we have in Edo State. The healthcare delivery in Edo State is terrible. Worse in our own place. Worse in Edo not. Because of the absence of federal health center, nothing happens. 
for the past three months, I have lost very close relations to diseases that are not supposed to kill people. The only way they can get anything close to good healthcare is to go to a, a do center where there's a federal uh, 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 facility. facility. I mean, Bini, they have a lot of federal facilities. I believe the problem is state. If there if if were no federal facilities in the Edo Center and Edo South, the same problem could have happened. So do we say this is a wake-up call? Let's say you, you, you wear about two or three feathers to be able to sensitize people. Let's, government can't do it all. That's what we keep hearing. To put those facilities in place. First, you are the president of a soccer club, immediate past president of a, a lady of Fatima, Daco Foundation, what do you think can be done to give the people of the Edo North good health facility? Even now, we pray there is no pandemic or outbreak of this pandemic there. I'm not sure the facility is there to curtail whatever will happen. Well, like I said, in my own little way, I have been making my contributions. Let's not and look at you now. I know, I know. We will take I know. Uh -huh. we, have, we have been working as a, as a team. I don't want to give you more details right now on how to improve that situation. But I must tell you that if the state government wants to actually make impact in that place, it's very simple. Federal Medical Center at Epoma is, is, not, is, not, is not supposed to be the teaching hospital of Edo, Edo State University. Edo State can set up their teaching hospital in Edo North. The presence of specialists from that facility will even help to improve the quality of service in private hospital in that facility. And uh, of course, most of these teaching hospitals, they are satellite uh, uh, stations where they attend to attenuated uh, patients, uh, they do the minor surgeries, and of course they have a good referral system. As it is right now, there is no way to refer somebody to. So don't even talk about referral system. Your primary health care, good referral system, and uh, they, are, they are paramount in good health care delivery in any community. We don't have it because there is no way to refer to. Okay. And you took it out of me because sometimes, to a large extent, we expect so much from government because uh, we have been in another interactive session where we, we say, I mean, we say that government can't do it all. Healthcare is expensive, and there are other things that governments have to do. Don't you think there should be some form of contribution by everybody, even the rural person, the, those who own the private practitioners, and all that, to really, really improve? Healthcare in Nigeria, particularly the rural healthcare. Well, that is the head, the head insurance. Uh, most part of the world, head insurance is the, the in thing. Because uh, it's, it's an insurance, just like any other insurance, where people put money in a pool, put minimum amount, minimum in quotes, with the hope that not all of us will fall ill at the same time. Exactly. For those that fall ill at a particular time, they don't have I mean, a, to run around looking for money. Money is there to take care of them. It's a win-win uh, thing. The patient pay this money, they are not strained. The health facilities, they have a lot to do. And the government had minimal stress. People don't, I mean, castigate them a lot. But unfortunately, even the one we are running here, it's a disaster. <laughs> I mean, they call it, it is good the Nigeria way. Nigeria way. It's, it's, it's very bad. Okay. Now, we started the conversation with family health. You know what? What is the state of family health in Nigeria? We cannot be talking about the community health now. Let's look at family health, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic and coronavirus. How healthy is our family? Well, again, that is a very interesting question for reasons that I cannot explain. The coronavirus uh, infection has not really touched our people the way it's done in other places. Maybe we have some degree of immunity. I don't know because. Uh, the way, I mean, the time, the first time the, the disease was diagnosed in Nigeria, if you look at other foreign countries, other European countries, that also had the diagnosis at that time, you see the way it has swept those communities. We don't have it here. Maybe with time, we're going to find out something that has been responsible. If it had affected all like that, it would have been a terrible disaster. Because is it social distancing that we are observing? <laughs> is it hand washing that we are observing? Is it face masks? Both people wear their face masks on the job. And... They, they don't care, and uh, they don't because they believe that it's one big man that's supposed to have it. I mean, not until it, to it touches you. About four days ago, I lost a close person to coronavirus. That has further made me know that this thing is a very serious matter. 
So whatever you have been doing before, do more. Because he, he, the man that died, you look at his circumstances around him, find it difficult for you to believe he got exposed to such a virus. But it's kidding. Mm, interesting. So the, the state in our country is terrible because the family system in our country is so that we believe in uh, hugging, coming together, with everything together, praying together, and uh, believing that my friend cannot have it. That person cannot have it. So, but what I believe now that I tell my staff is that always assume everybody has it except you. Here you have it, Dr. Mamou Dako, Medical Director, Dako Medical Center, Dako Foundation founder, President, Isaka Club 81, immediate past president, a lady of Fatima Old Boys College. I captured it all. Is that, have I left out any? <laughs> You've done more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for being a magnet mm -hmm. of the week. It's also a family health physician. That's why he came here to come and tutor and lecture us. Being a, a mentor today. Remember, the magnet is still open for sponsorship. Your collaboration, your partnership, your support is still needed. So we can endure. That's our program for the week. To join us same time next week for another edition when we shall bring you another magnet where you can be learning from lending a voice to business growth and mentoring on television join us then bye for now <laughs>